Okay, when you finish signing the sheet, would you pass it to the far right side? Okay, according to the clock up here, it's 10.58, but uh, it looks like we have a pretty good group here, so I'm going to go on and open up uh, the event for today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is an honor to have you here this morning to help us celebrate the second African lecture series sponsored by the Africa Council. The idea was discussed by members of the Africa Council for many, many years. And we finally incorporated the idea a few years ago when UGA hosted our first Africa lecture series. And we hope to continue this event every year. Internationalizing the curriculum is one of the initiatives of the University System of Georgia, um, Middle Georgia State University, and the Africa Council. In addition, this lecture series every spring semester will complement our annual Fall Southeast Model African Union Conference, which is in its 22nd year. Thus, we are very, very honored to have Dr. Eustace Palmer, a renowned writer, critic, and scholar with us today to open our Africa lecture series here on Middle Georgia State University's campus. And as I said, we hope this continues uh, on an annual basis. Right now it's been like every two years and this is the second one, but we hope to make this an annual event and it will move from campus to campus, just like the Model African Union Conference does. It goes from campus to campus every November. As most of you know, the cost of studying abroad in Africa is quite expensive. So by having conferences where students learn about different countries and having speakers come in to talk about the literature and having an council uh, from Liberia to come in and talk about issues on the continent, these are ways that we can present information to you about the continent of Africa in a very economical way. And we hope that you will take something away from this lecture today. At this time, Dr. Amy Burke will come forward and give greetings on behalf of the university and, and our department, Department of English. Good morning. Uh, let me also extend my greetings to everyone here today, particularly our esteemed guest. I would like to thank Dr. Mary Mears and Dr. Peter Micaia for their work in hosting the lecture series, Modern African Literature, Culture, and Identity. I would also like to recognize Dr. Mears, my value in the English department, to thank her for teaching a newly developed course this semester, Studies in African Literature, and I see some of her students here today. The course has been a highlight of our course offerings on the Macon and Conquering campuses this spring. Dr. Mears also serves as advisor to the Southeast Model African Union Student Organization here at MGA and was recently elected chair of the University System Africa Council. Thank you, Dr. Mears, for the lecture today, and thank you all for coming. Um, a native Sierra Leonean, Dr. Palmer, in Sierra Leone and the United Kingdom, where he obtained an honors degree and PhD in English language and literature from the University of Edinburgh. He taught for several years at Faraha Bay College, the University of Sierra Leone, where he was professor of English, dean of the Faculty School of Arts, public orator, and Dean of Graduate Studies. He has also taught at the University of Texas, Austin, and Randolph-Macon Women's College, 
where he was an African scholar in residence. He has published over 60 articles on English and African literatures. He has published four novels, A Hanging is Announced, Confaro's Travels, A Tale of Three Women, A Pillar of the Community. His awards include, but not limited to, the African Association Distinguished Member Award and Georgia College and State University Distinguished Professor Award. Dr. Palmer teaches at Georgia College and State University, the Public Liberal Arts University of the state of Georgia, where he is Distinguished Professor of English and Coordinator of African Studies. Dr. Palmer. Well, good morning, and um, thank you very much for that um, um, delightful um, introduction. I'm really honored to be um, the, the guest speaker um, today in this uh, Africa lecture series. I'm very grateful to my colleague, Mary and Peter, uh, for arranging this, because I'm also, I've been a member of the University System Africa Council since about 1995. I, I, I therefore, I'm in the middle of all the arrangements that that council um, makes. Um, the title of my talk um, this morning is Modern African Literature, Culture and Identity. First, let me um, be quite clear uh, about the definitions of the terms that I will be using uh, in the course of this talk. By culture, I mean the entire way of life of a people, including its customs, its traditions, its religion, art, literature, uh, its values, and so on. By identity, I will be referring to what the people perceive uh, of themselves. Um, it is largely a question of perception, how they perceive themselves and how others um, perceive them. In other words, the kind of identity that others would like to impose on them and how they see um, themselves. With the proviso that this is what we have in mind when talking about culture and uh, identity, uh, endeavor in the course of this talk to explore the ways in which modern uh, African literature reflects African culture and the African identity and the African um, personality. But I shall also be looking at this literature's reflection of differing attitudes um, to uh, African culture and the African personality or identity. Um, let me also stress that by modern African literature, really just talking about contemporary African literature, I'm talking about written African literature. So it's modern African literature as um, opposed to traditional African literature or oral literature. Um, so by modern African literature, I'm really talking written literature. There's the literature which started around about the 1930s, the 1940s of the present day. Now, the first point that I would like to stress is that traditional African literature, oral literature, which itself uh, is uh, an essential component of um, African culture, this literature, traditional literature, had a profound impact on the development of modern um, African um, literature. There are even scholars who would assert that the modern African novel emerged directly from the African oral tradition and was not just influenced by the Western novel, that is by the novels of people like Conrad and George Eliot and Charles Dickens and so on. That the African novel is an autonomous, uh, authentic African product which derived from uh, the African folk tale. 
and that in reading novels like Things Fall Apart, one can hear the accents of the African um, storyteller. So they would claim that the African novel is an authentic um, um, construct. Well, this, of course, is debatable, and the jury is still out on that, but one can have a really good debate uh, about that. Um, the, it is incontestable, however, that various forms of African oral law, the folk tale, the myths and legends, proverbs and riddles, and, of course, uh, oral poetry, had a profound impact on writers like Chinua Achebe, Wally Shoinka, Christopher Okigbo, when they pioneered the rise of modern African literature in the 50s and 60s. Some of these writers, like Chinua Achebe, incorporate aspects of the oral tradition into the novels. Tales that, for instance, in Things Fall Apart, and there's an abundant use of proverbs, as you all know, in that um, novel. Moreover, these tales are just embellishments. They have a thematic relevance. Of course, they are stylistic, but they also have a thematic relevance. For instance, at one point in Things Fall Apart, we um, have this proverb used, the following proverb. The bird and neck into your bath was asked why he was always flying without perching. In other words, he was always flying without stopping. Um, and he replied, men of today have learned to shoot without missing. And therefore, I have learned to fly without perching. Men of today have learned to shoot without missing. Therefore, I have learned to fly without perching. I wonder whether any of the students would be um, willing to tell me what really that proverb means. Men of today learned to fly without, uh, learned to shoot without missing, so I have learned to fly without stopping. Anyway, am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> well, yes. Good, yes, you responded positively to the threat that good that is out there. In other words, you adapt. You adapt to the new situation or what will happen. You die. You adapt to the situation or you die. Um, even well-established cultures have to be receptive to or at least consider new ideas if they are not to become ossified. Now, this is a crucial theme in Things Fall Apart, the need to adapt to new, a new situation, and I'll be discussing um, this later. Well, a showing care for his own part, makes abundant use of traditional oriture um, in plays such as The Dance of the Forest and Death of the King's Horseman. Christopher Kigbo's poetry, uh, it's riddled, one might say, um, with um, references to um, African ritual. In fact, the, the poems like Heaven's Gate sound like readings out of traditional African poetry. Amos Tutuola, um, in his groundbreaking work, um, The Palm Wine Drinkard, I don't know how many people are familiar with The Palm Wine Drinkard, um, what Tutuala did in the Palm Wine Drinkard was to string together tales from his people's oral tradition to form one continuous whole that one might call an epic. Just as Homer, as you know, in order to uh, create the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, strung together tales from the Greek oral um, tradition. Indeed, the publication of Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinker in 1952 has been generally regarded as heralding um, the, the dawn of modern African. 
Um, so the point um, that I'm trying to make is that the modern African writer, while being receptive to Western influences, since some of them had read their Pound and Elliot and George Elliot and so on, nevertheless derived the, the main inspiration from traditional life and culture. Now, the case for poetry is even more conclusive. There was a time when scholars of African literature thought that modern African poets like Shoinka or Kigbo, Lenry Peters and Okara modeled their works on Western um, poets and people like Pound and Yeats and Eliot. And that that, in a sense, accounts for the difficulty of some modern African um, poets. Now, um, if this were true, it would re view held by some scholars that modern African literature is an offshoot of Western literature rather than an authentic um, and genuine phenomenon. But it is not true, and research has taught us otherwise. The difficulty and obscurity which we see uh, in modern African poetry derives not from the difficulty of Western poetry, but from the difficulty of poems in the African oral tradition, from cult poetry, for instance. Because African poetry, African ritual poetry, it's difficult because it has to be known by only a few people. And therefore, these poems uh, make use of images and symbols that only a few people will understand. So the difficulty of a lot of modern African poetry really derives from traditional African oral poetry, not from Western um, um, now, the inclination of modern African poets to model their works on traditional African oral poetry continues up to the present day. We can see this, for instance, in the poetry of Benjamin Kwache. Benjamin Kwache, who is really, as far as I'm concerned, one of the, the, the leading um, uh, African um, poets. And let me read um, one of his poems. Come gather your salutes. Nana, queen mother of Edwisu, we salute you. Ashante backbone, when the foul to Nana Prempe, come gather your salutes. The land that is not possible to see, yet breath of a nation's clogged nostrils, we salute you. They tore your heart asunder, but could not steal your spirit. Nana, come gather your salutes. Men shook at the threat of cannon fire and the spirit, spit fire of Hodgson, but he bargained with a wrong breast. Come apim, apim beba, kill a thousand, a thousand more will come. Ashanti warrior defying the color of the northern wind, braver than the lion's wounded teeth. No, beyond warrior, warrior, I invent a word for you. Come gather your salutes. They forgot that you are the gatherer of snails who mushrooms them elephants. Yes, you, born on the same day, as fire and fierier than fire, eating fire in your sleep and splitting it in seven, we salute you. Now, obviously, um, this poem is modeled on traditional African praise poem. The praise poem in Africa is the commonest form of traditional African poetry, of oral poetry, the praise poem. And obviously, Benjamin Kwache is modeling this, his modern poem, on the African praise poem. He's praying um, the Asantewa. You see, uh, it, as I've said, it's, it's a pr praise poem, uh, a poem in praise of the Queen Mother. I don't know how many of you are aware that in Ghana they have the institution called the Queen Mother, a very powerful woman, the Asante uh, Itiwa. And um, it is this woman um, whom Kwache is praising. Um, and and uh, loading her uh, activities. This was a woman who led her country in 
at the time when the British, in order to um, consolidate um, their uh, conquest of Ghana, um, imprisoned the Asantehine himself. And his mother uh, rallied her people in rebellion against the, the British. Um, so here, uh, well, again, the point I'm making is that while the pioneer African writers and even contemporary African writers were influenced by their Western education and their exposure to various forms of European literature, a phenomenon that is in in inevitable, the mainspring of the nation derived from traditional African sources. Now, in a sense, modern African literature is said to be a reaction towards certain Western attitudes attitudes to African life and culture. In a sense, modern African literature is Africa answering back, um, so to speak. Um, modern African writers were trying to reassert and proclaim the true African identity, to refute the reputation of Africa in the Western media by celebrating various aspects of African and to this enterprise, the late Chinua Achebe was absolutely central. Chinua Achebe was undoubted, so to speak, the mighty man of African letters, the father of African literature. In his own words, he showed us where the rain began to beat us. That is where, as it were, the, the continent went wrong under the impact of um, colonialism. He showed us where we have come from, where we are, and who and where we ought to be. More than arguably any other African writer, his work taken as a whole celebrated the totality and authenticity of the African traditional past. And he was doing this in refutation of those people in the West who for various reasons wanted to put Africa down. And he did it without, in his own words, gloss, I quote, glossing over inconvenient facts. Now, he um, presented the following that I'm going to list. The traditional past, which I've mentioned, the clash between that traditional past, that traditional culture, and the new methods and values Produced by an ignorant, arrogant, and uncomprehending imperialist onslaught. He presented the temptations and indeed the complexity of the problems facing the new African elite as they prepared countries to independence. He presented the strains and stresses in African life during the immediate post independence era as African nations sought to rediscover themselves, redefine their values and respond to problems that were partly the legacy of um, colonialism. And also, of course, partly the consequences of corrupt and incompetent leaders. He presented the sufferings of the African peoples under repressive and authoritarian regimes and during brutal civil wars. He presented the hope of a glorious in which all segments of the society, including students, workers, and women in particular, will play their rightful part and where the path will never close. His work thus deals not only with traditional Africa, but with all the phases associated with the total African experience. In other words, told the story of Africa, as he himself said, from an African perspective, in full earshot of the world. And he did it all while manifesting the most consummate artistry and superbly blending form and content in a way that had never been done before by any African writer. And it is probably the most egregious lack of awareness of this that prevented the Nobel um, Committee from awarding him the Nobel Prize for Literature a prize that according to any reasonable um, critic, he more than richly 
deserved. And this is why most of this talk will uh, concentrate on Achebe uh, and his novel, Things Fall Apart, which I'm told most of you have read, but it will also mention Arrow of God. Above all, Things Fall Apart was a magnificent and much needed exercise in cultural and historical reclamation. Fully rising to the demands of his role as both novelist and teacher, Achebe sought to teach not only Europeans and the West in general, but also Africans who lacked knowledge of their history and their um, culture. He wanted to teach them about the grandeur, the dignity, the majesty, the order of traditional African life and culture. Let us take our minds back to the date of the publication of Things Fall Apart. It was 1958. Intensive research into African history and African culture was only just beginning. This was the time when a historian like Hugh Trevor Roper, the religious professor of history at Oxford University, could make the appalling statement that Africa has no history. Think about it. He said, Africa has no history. And I, I'm sure and I hope that all of you can see the stupidity of a statement. Africa has no history. And he went on to say that the African past was, and I quote, nothing but the unrewarding gyrations of barbarous tribes. The African past was nothing but the unrewarding gyrations of barbarous tribe. Another famous British historian, Arnold Toynbee, could assert that Africa had not contributed positively to any civilization. And even the German philosopher Hegel asserted that Africa did not constitute part of the history of the world. Africa did not constitute part of the history of the world. Think about that. Both people in the West, whose imaginations had been fueled by the sensationalized accounts of earlier travelers like, travelers like Henry Morton Stanley, Ryder Haggard, and others, still thought that Africa was a disorganized, benighted, backward place inhabited by dirty, lazy, pagan peoples, incapable of rational thought, of participating in certain disciplines, and who had to be rescued from the consequences of their own barbarism by the blessings of imperialism. And of course, as you're aware, this kind of view still holds today, even here in the United States, in the highest, uh, the highest levels of government uh, and so on. We are all, I hope, aware of that. And if I speak with, um, uh, uh, with a certain fee amount of feeling about this, it's because I come from um, uh, Africa. Well, the truth, of course, was quite different. Diversified historical methodology, the use of non-Western Arabic sources like the writings of Al-Bakri and Ali Dris, and the result of linguistic and archaeological research have given us quite a different view of the African past and the, the, of traditional African culture and identity. In the 50s, the process was just beginning and Achebe's Things Fall Apart played a gigantic role in setting the record straight. In particular, we know that Achebe was reacting to the works of two writers who had presented a particularly jaundiced view of traditional African life. These were Joseph Conrad and Joyce Carey. Conrad, as a result of his journey up the then River Congo at the turn of the 20th century, had all but presented Africans in his celebrated novel, Heart of Darkness, which I hope that many of you have read. He presented Africans as cannibalistic individuals. In the most ghastly rituals and capable of corrupting the pure Western man, Mr. Kutz, and introducing him to all kinds of barbaric practices. The very of the title, Heart of Darkness, speaks volumes. Whatever critics might say about the artistry of Heart of Darkness, there can be no doubt that God was pondering to the way in which the Western imagination even up to 
day at times equates blackness and darkness with evil. Blackness and darkness with evil. We even talk about things like blackmail and what have you, um, that kind of thing. We, we, and we all know about Achebe's celebrated response to Conrad, um, in which he accused Conrad of racism. It's in the article, his article, An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This was Achebe's response, it's quite well known. Joyce Carey, for his part, had presented in the novel Mr. Johnson, which was set in northern Nigeria, a foolish and laughable protagonist, Mr. Johnson. And a lot of uh, African intellectuals, including Achebe, saw Mr. Johnson or the presentation of Mr. Johnson as a caricature, a laughable caricature, not the real thing. It was not a fair picture of a traditional African or of traditional African society. And this is why Achebe sought to present in the representation of Umofia and in the creation of a Konku, a portrait of a genuine African traditional society and a genuine African gentleman in Okonku. The traditional society that Achebe presents <coughs> in this part is a highly organized and religious society with its own social and judicial structure. Cry from the chaos that African detractors would have us believe the imperialists found. For this society is a highly religious society. And what does one mean by a religious um, society? If by a religious people, we mean people who believe in the existence of a supreme being or supernatural being, and people who obey the dictates of those supernatural beings, then there could be no more religious people than the inhabitants of Umorphia. The most, um, this must surely be one of the most important aspects of Achebe's legacy, his demonstration that traditional Africans had religion, they were not pagans. Remember, this was 1958, before the culmination of the civil rights movement here in the United States, when only one sub-Saharan country, Ghana, had gained um, its in, in, in independence. And there was tremendous ignorance about Africa in most of the world. So we see the, the, the religious practice, uh, practices in Omorphia. Um, we see the complex hierarchy of gods and deities, major and minor, Ani, Ujuku, Ifejoka. The entire lives of the people of Omorphia are regulated by the need to obey the dictates of the gods, however harsh those dictates may be. Indeed, what some might consider to be the harsh um, but practices of these people are dictated precisely by the need here to the dictates of a god. So if a god's oracle says that an innocent 14-year-old boy from another clan must be killed, they feel they have no alternative but to do so. If the goddess Ani says that twins are an abomination and must be thrown alive into the evil forest, or that anyone who dies of the swelling sickness should not be buried in, uh, 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 among the community, then so be it. The case of Ikemefuna is interesting, and I hope you all know about Ikemefuna, the boy who was um, killed on the orders of the, the oracle. They surely led to this in the Judeo-Christian um, Judeo scheme. I wonder if anyone can tell me the parallel to this in the Judeo-Christian scheme. The story of Ikemefuna, who was killed by he and all this, yes? Yeah, the story, obviously, of Abraham and Isaac. You remember the story? God tells Abraham to go and cut off um, Isaac's head. Does Abraham complain? Does he give you? No. He doesn't say a word. He just takes the boy and builds an altar. The boy says, yes, but where is the ram? Abraham says, God will provide. And he's about to cut off the boy's head when God says, no, no, don't do it. I was only testing you. 
Now, Abraham in that episode shows his in God, his religiosity, if you like, by um, accepting completely the dictates of God. It is the same with the uh, in this Ikemefuna um, incident. Now, one of the most interesting events in things is that in which the missionary, Mr. Brown, visits the elder Akuna, and they discuss theological matters, and I quote, you say there is one supreme God who made heaven and earth, said Akuna on one of Mr. Brown's visits. We also believe in him and call him Chukwu. He made all the world gods. There are no other gods, said Mr. Brown. Or Chukwu is the only god and all the others are false. You carve a piece of wood like that one. He pointed at the rafters from which Akuna's carved Kenga hung. And you call it a god, but it's still a piece of wood. Yes, said Akuna. It is indeed a Wood. The tree from which it came was made by Chuku, as indeed all minor gods were. But he made them for his messengers so that we could approach him through them. What is being demonstrated in this episode um, is the essential similarity between Christianity and the traditional religion of the Omorphians. The belief in one supreme God, one supreme being, even if there are minor um, gods. And of course, there are some Christian sects, as you know, who make wooden images of the uh, of supernatural beings and uh, and so on. Well, quite a few of the early Western explorers and travelers into Africa took back with them reports of a chaotic society of people who did not understand the concept of governance, the observation of law and order. And this was partly done in order to justify not only missionary activity but imperialism. It was one of Achebe's intentions to demonstrate that this was far from being the case. Africa, African society was really quite organized. The elaborate social and administrative structure of the Imorphians ensured fair play, and it's a system that works. The various social units like the family, the lineage, lineage groups, the age groups, the council of elders, the oracles, the part, and the religious, social, and judicial systems are interconnected. Now, one of the great set pieces in Things Fall Apart is that in which some elders of the clan, wearing the masks of the nine ancestors, form a kind of supreme court. Now, does this remind you of any? Yeah, the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, why does it remind you of that? <laughs> nine, yes. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court of the United States. There are nine on the Supreme Court of the Omorphians. Is the highest court, as you can see from Achebe's um, things fall apart. This is the court that sits in judgment on the most difficult cases. And the sanctions for those who transgress the laws are set. No exceptions are made. Okonkwo transgresses the laws. He is a big man in this community, but they don't make any exception for him. He pays the penalty just like everyone else. This is a society that shows tremendous concern for the observation of the proper protocols, proper modes of behavior. Thus, visitors, when, they go to, uh, when you go to pay a visit, the host offers you a cola nut. Um, palm wine is poured. Um, th think, for instance, of the scene where Okonkwo goes to Nwakibie to ask for seed yams to plant uh, on his farm. Um, neighbors are called in to witness. This is the youngest man who pulls out the, the palm wine. Not anyone, but the youngest man pulls out the palm wine. The first cup must go to Okonkwo. Can anyone tell me why? Why must the first cup? Remember, it was Okonkwo brought the wine. So he must drink first. To make sure it's not poisoned, yes to make sure it's good, to make sure it's not poisoned. So things are done in a certain kind of order. The proper protocol has to be observed. Um, after Okongo has drunk, then the men drink in order of seniority. 
in any order, in order of seniority. When the men have drunk, very unfortunately, the women um, can drink. It's the turn of the women. But they too do not just drink in any order. It's the eldest wife who must drink first. And if she's not there, the others have to wait for her. So the eldest wife drinks up. I quote, she walked up to her husband and accepted the horn from him. She, she doesn't just drink in any order. She walked up um, um, to her husband and accepted the horn from him. She then went down on one knee, drank a little, and handed back the horn. She rose, called him by his name, and went back to her hut. The other one drank in, this, in their proper order and went away. You see, there's a tremendous delicacy in relationships, a tremendous concern for protocol. And I'm told, uh, I was told by someone that here in the United States, there was this Ni Nigerian woman, don't offend anyone, who was talking on, the, uh, on her cell phone to her husband uh, several thousand miles away in Nigeria. She was talking on her cell phone to him. And, but whenever she mentioned his name, although she, he wasn't present, whenever she mentioned his name, she did that. Even though he was not present, she had so internalized this procedure that even though the husband was not present, on the mention of his name, he was always doing that. And she appeared ridiculous, of course, um, um, to uh, others. Um, so a highly organized society, therefore. This is also a society that shows tremendous tolerance and consideration for strangers. And it's interesting that although the British missionaries and administrators take advantage of their position, they're initially welcomed by the people and allowed to stay as long as they behave themselves. I think this is remarkable at a time when we in the United States are concerned about immigration and there are so many groups that are anxious to keep immigrants um, out. Um, so this is uh, um, Achebe um, uh, presenting African culture, showing that African culture is vibrant and the society is an ordered society uh, and so on. Of course, Achebe had said that in his presentation of traditional African society, he would not glow convenient facts and he doesn't. So he's very objective in his presentation. The attempt to demonstrate the vibrancy and dignity of traditional African life and culture was not confined to people like Achebe and other Anglophones. The Anglophones were those who lived in the um, former um, British colonies as opposed to the Francophones. Indeed, it goes much further back than the activities of writers like Achebe. It was the major preoccupation of the adherents of the concept of negritude. And I hope um, some of you have heard about negritude. I'll talk uh, about it in some detail. Negritude, put simply, means complete recognition and assertion of being black black and proud, um, so to speak. It's consciousness of and pride in being black and African. So once more, it's a reaction to Western attitudes um, towards African life and culture. It has everything to do with the assertion of the African personality and the African identity. It has everything to do with the perception Africans had of themselves and that others had of them, and with the attitudes of uh, um, Europeans um, towards African life and culture. It was essentially a reaction to colonial policy, especially French colonial policy. You see, while the British practiced the policy of indirect rule, the French practice the policy called assimilation. The French had always and still have always been very proud of their culture. They think that their culture is much better than any other culture on earth. So what they tried to do in their colonies was to embrace as many of the black Africans as possible within this much bigger ambience of French culture and civilization. Um, 
And even up to the time of independence, had black children in African schools forced to recite every morning that their ancestors were Gauls. You know who the Gauls were? They were the ancestors of the French. In other words, they were forced to recite every morning, these black children, that their ancestors were white Frenchmen and French women. So this was what you see um, the, um, the, the, the French um, did. Now, the situation was exacerbated by the fact that many of these uh, uh, Francophone youngsters were sent to universities um, in France where their personalities were um, older even um, further. But then they did not get the impression, although they alienated, the word used is alienation, although they had become alienated from their roots in the traditional African culture by being transposed um, to the, 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 the West, they did not have the feeling that they were accepted as Frenchmen and French women. They were therefore in a kind of cultural limbo. And it was for this reason that some African intellectuals like um, Senghor, and the Diops, together with others from the French West Indies who are going through similar experiences, embraced the concept of negritude. The movement was actually started by black intellectuals in French West Indian colonies like Martinique. Now, why were, why were the Francophone intellectuals in the West Indies so instrumental in the establishment of the negritude movement. The reason was that they had, remember this were in the West Indies, they had been um, exposed to a double transplantation. Not only had they been taken from their homes in Africa to the West Indies, they were now being taken from the West Indies to France. So they uh, had to endure a kind of double alienation and were therefore in a greater cultural limbo. Indeed, the first significant publication by the Negritude movement was Aimé Césaire's long poem, Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, or A Return to My Native Land. The fact that Negritude was co started by West Indian Francophone intellectuals suggests that it was not just an African movement. In fact, I would suggest that negritude was part of a global, a bigger global um, movement of people of African descent. And it had connections and all kinds of ramifications to Pan-Africanism, the Pan-Africanism of people like Marcus Garvey and W.B. Du Bois, the Black Consciousness Movement, which was prevalent here in the United States, the Harlem Renaissance, they were all related, and uh, Alan Locke's ideas as presented in the New Negro. The civil rights movement also uh, was part of this. All these were part of the general drive towards the emancipation, the liberation of the black man, the African man, and, and so on. They were all out to celebrate African values, to present a distinctive vision of Africa and the black man, to show that Africa and the black man the world over had a culture and an identity and an essence that were of value. And that the black man needed to be liberated not only from political shackles, but from cultural shackles as well. The first publication of the Negative Movement was a one-issue student journal by French Antillians in Paris in 1932. And it's significant that in that publication, the contributors paid tribute to Langston Hughes and Claude McKay, both of them leaders of the Harlem Renaissance here in the United States. Présence Africaine, a very influential journal which presented the poems and ideas of members of the Negritude Movement, was published by Alion Diop in 1947. And in 1949, Leopold said a single leading African intellectual, a future president of Senegal, published his groundbreaking and monumental, uh, an anthology of Black and Malagasy poetry. 
an anthology of black and Malagasy poetry. The French philosopher, um, Marxist and Marxist, um, Jean-Paul Sartre, wrote uh, an interesting introduction or preface um, to this volume, a preface which has now been regarded as one of the most subtle um, descriptions of the negritude movement. Negritude also had its Marxist wing. This, in a sense, is quite understandable. The negritudes were opposed to and reacting to the consequences of colonialism, which they saw as furthering the degradation exploitation of the black man an exploitation that included economic exploitation. Marxism was also concerned with economic exploitation, but it largely emphasized the economic exploitation of the proletariat. The negritudes recognized the economic exploitation of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie, but they also saw the connection between capitalism and colonialism, another central concern of Marxism. Unlike the Marxists, however, like Jean-Paul Sartre, they could not separate the race problem from the class problem. What they had experienced in the colonial situation was an exploitation based not just on class, but on race. The black man in history had been exploited and enslaved by the European partly because he was black. It was both economic and racial. So the negritudes sought to expand um, the uh, Marxism to include economic exploitation based on race. Let us now just briefly consider the characteristics of negritude as displayed in the poetry. First, there's the insistent embrace of Africa and the celebration and glorification of African values. Um, let me just read very um, quickly from David Diop's um, Africa. David Diop's Africa. Africa, my Africa of proud warriors in ancestral savannas. Africa of whom my grandmother sings on the banks of the distant river. I've never known you, but the flows in my veins. Your beautiful black blood that irrigates the fields, the blood of your sweat of your work, the work of your slavery, the slavery of your children. Africa, tell me, Africa, is this you, this back that is bent, this back that breaks under the weight of humiliation, this back trembling with red scars and saying yes to the whip under the midday sun? But a gray voice answers me, impetuous son, that tree young and strong, that tree there in splendid loveliness amidst white and faded flowers, that is Africa, your Africa, that grows again patiently, obstinately, and its fruit gradually acquires the bitter taste of liberty. So you see the glorification of um, Africa. Other relevant poems, poems like Nine, and one of the most famous negritude poems is this one by Leopold Seda Senghor called Black Woman. Because here, what Senghor does is to equate the black woman with Mother Africa. So the black woman becomes Mother Africa, a figure to be respected, a nurturing uh, figure, um, tremendously fertile and so on. I'll read it quickly. Naked woman, black woman, clothed with your color, which is life, with your form, which is beauty. In your shadow, I have grown up. The gentleness of your hands was laid over my eyes. And now, high up on the sun, they heart of summer, at the heart of noon, I come upon you, my promised land. So you see the way in which the world is equated with the land of Africa. And your beauty strikes me to the heart like the flash of an eagle. Naked woman, dark woman, firm-fleshed ripe fruit, somber raptures of black wine, mouth-making lyrical my mouth, stretching to clear horizons, savannah shuddering beneath the east wind's eager caresses. Carved tum tum, taught tum tum, muttering under the conqueror's fingers. Solemn, solemn contractor voice is the spiritual song of the beloved. Naked woman, dark woman, oil that no breath ruffles, calm oil on the athlete's flanks, on the flanks of the princes of Mali, 
gazelle limbed in paradise, pearls as stars on the night of your skin, the light, the glinting of red gold against your watered skin. Under the shadow of your hair, my care is lightened by the neighboring suns of your eyes. Naked woman, black woman, I sing your beauty that passes, the form that I fix in the eternal. Before jealous fate turned you to ashes to feed the roots of life. You see, the negative poets are noted for their celebration of various aspects of African culture, such as African music, African instruments, African musicality in general. In fact, Sengo's poems, many of the poems uh, are meant to be recited against um, the background of the playing of certain um, musical instruments. By the same token, the, uh, the Negritude poets celebrate African masks, African masks, which are the masks of the ancestors, and which show the connection between the world of the living, the world of the dead, and the world of the unborn. Um, of course, the celebration of attitude by the negativist poets in involved a criticism of Western values. This was inevitable since the West was the home of capitalism and the perpetrator of imperialism. African values were seen to be superior to Western values, while the West was seen to be materialistic, addicted to technology and skyscrapers and so on an individualism characterized by lovelessness, as the poet suggests, and a lack of feeling and emotion. African civilization, on the other hand, was seen to be infused by spirituality, a sense of community, and a love of nature and the natural. The best example of this is a poem by Senghor called New York. I don't have time to read it now, but maybe you can look at it. It's called New York. Now, the Anglophones, those from the former British territories, were not as enthusiastic about negritude as the Francophones were, mainly because I suppose the, the Anglophones had not been as alienated from their culture as the Francophones were. You remember the British practiced the policy of indirect rule, which meant leaving African culture more or less as it was, and even using some of the African leaders in their administration, as the French practiced the policy of assimilation. So the Anglophones were rather skeptical of negritude, and typical of the skepticism was Wale Shoinka's famous a tiger, and I quote him, a tiger does not proclaim its tigritude. A tiger does not proclaim its tigritude. You can tell it by its pounce. A tiger does not proclaim its tigritude. You can tell it by its pounce. In other words, if I am black and proud, well, yeah, I'm just black and proud. I don't need to go shout on the rooftops. I just have to be black and proud, and everyone will realize that I'm black and proud. So the tiger doesn't need to go about shouting that he is uh, a tiger. Uh, in a sense, um, I think um, he is, this is unfair um, because the Americans um, were responding to the fact that, in fact, um, the Western world did not see the black man, uh, black woman, as they really were. And therefore, there was a need to assert African personality, African identity, African values, uh, and, uh, and so on. And this also interesting, and, and, and the Anglophone reaction was puzzling, because they were doing precisely the same thing that the Francophones were doing. Achebe, as I've tried to illustrate in Things Fall Apart, is in fact celebrating African traditional life and values. So does Wale Shoinka in a play like Death of the King's Horseman. I think the difference between the Anglophones and the Francophones is that while the Francophones over-idealized African society, glamorized African society, just that African traditional society was superior to Western society, the Anglophones, on the other hand, were more objective. They presented not only the strengths of African life and culture, but also the weaknesses, as you can see in Achebe's Things Fall Apart. I suppose I should... <laughs> well, we'll have questions at the end. But I just want 
a word about um, language. You see, language is an extremely vital aspect of culture, one of the most important markers of identity. In other words, the language one uses who one is or who one would be perceived to be. African writers' use of language is therefore an extremely important factor. We all know that most of modern African literature was written in one or other of the metropolitan languages, such as English, French, or Portuguese, not in African languages. The pioneer modern African writers were forced to write in these languages, not only to ensure wide publication and a wide audience, but also because many of the indigenous African languages were not written languages. And if they wrote in these languages, they would not have an audience um, at all. Now, this posed problems. African writers were forced to write in languages that were not their own but they had to reflect a genuine African personality. How was this to be done? One of Achebe's major achievements in Things Fall Apart is to demonstrate for the benefit of later writers how they communicate their insights and present a genuine African environment um, while still using one or other the metropolitan languages. So Achebe has been at the center of the discourse regarding the use of the English language by African writers. He could have written in his native Igbo, but then things fall apart would certainly not have gained the worldwide audience. And we must remember that one of Achebe's purposes was to educate non-Africans also about um, Africa. Quite perceptively, Achebe saw that while being a master of the language, the African writer had to bend the language, this foreign language that he's forced to use. He had to bend it to his um, um, purposes. And this is what Achebe um, does. As he himself has said, however, the African writer must do this from a position of strength not from a position of weakness. In other words, he must have mastered the language first before trying to bend it to suit his purposes. And this, of course, is precisely what Achebe does. I quote him from his memoir, There Was a Country. He says, some of us decided to tackle the big of the day, imperialism, slavery, gender, racism, etc., And some did not. One could write about roses or the air, about love of, for all, I cared. That was fine too. As for me, however, I chose the former, engaging such heavy subjects while at the same time trying to help create a unique and authentic African literary tradition would mean that some of us would decide to use the colonizer's tools, his language, altered sufficiently to bear the weight of an African creative aesthetic infused with elements of the African literary tradition. I borrowed from proverbs from our culture and history, colloquialisms and African expressive language from the ancient Greeks, the worldviews, perspectives, and customs from ego tradition and cosmology and the sensibilities of ordinary people. And we have seen the ways in which Achebe makes tremendous use of proverbs, which he says are the palm oil with which words are eaten. And you can study things fall apart, look at Hour of God, and you can see the host of proverbs that he uses to give the African flair to the language that he um, is um, the language that he is forced to use. Proverbs are also a distillation of the wisdom of the people, so that by using the proverbs, Achebe is not only solving a linguistic problem, but he is also representing the traditions, almost the history uh, of the Igbo uh, um, in, in people. And uh, some other um, um, writers have uh, uh, followed in his um, um, steps. Uh, finally, there's the issue of who is the African writer? What is the identity of the African writer? Must the African writer be born in Africa? Must the African writer be black? Um, that would exclude Nedin Godima or Kutsi uh, or Nagib Mafuz. 
Um, it, it's not just, and, and again, this is tied up with the question of what is African literature? Um, must African literature be literature about Africa? If we say that, we would have to include writer Haggard and Conrad and think of, think of including writer Haggard and Conrad. What one can say, I think, is that the African writer must exude um, a certain African sensibility. And this is why we might have to include people like Aminata Fauna and uh, uh, who had an African father, um, but a, a Scottish mother and has lived most, most of her life outside Africa. But she exudes the sensibility. And um, there are Africans who, though born in Africa, have lived quite a lot uh, in the West, but they're still writing. Have they retained this African sensibility? Or are they, as one critic said, merely like the spy, uh, regurgitating things from their entrails without deriving new sources of inspiration? on their residence on the continent. So all these issues are there. Some people have said we must now talk about the diasporic writer, the writer who lives in the diaspora but writes about African things. The debate is still going on. Um, that. Well, you can see that modern African literature um, is vibrant and the point I'm making is that it derives its um, strength and so on from African traditional life, African traditional culture, from the conversations also about the African identity and the African personality. I hope I've left enough time for questions. Thank you. That's something. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, would you say that like uh, European literature and stuff has gone through things like romanticism, naturalism, realism? Would you say African literature has done anything like that, or would it be more of the storytelling? Would that be their that kind of? Thing? Oh, it's much more um, yeah. uh, than uh, a storytelling. There's also experimentation in African um, literature. Um, and I, I, I take the work of Benjamin Kwache, for instance. He comes from Ghana, and as I've said, he's one of the leading um, uh, um, contemporary African writers, and he's doing all kinds of uh, tremendous things. I've recently been reading an epic in verse, a book-length epic written in verse, uh, and it's about the first time that this uh, has been done in Africa, and he makes use of of blank verse, of free verse, but also of rhyming couplets, of rhymes, so that you have the impression of compactness when you see the rhymes being used, but also of fluidity and fluency and so on, a tremendous uh, achievement. However, I think one must be careful about uh, applying concepts like romanticism and modernism and so on to African literature. Because again, one might be tending to seeing African literature as an offshoot of Western literature, which I have said it isn't. 
in any case, now one of the things that always gets me is when someone is looking at an African novel or writing about an African novel, I say, oh, there you have it. This is a postmodern novel. The postmodernism does not apply to Africa. Modernism and postmodernisms were concepts that arose out of the European situation. Modernism arose out of the kind of fragmentation that you had in the European psyche, gone about uh, um, the 1914 and so on, the flux in values. This was not, that was not the same sort of thing that was happening in Africa. The African writer is responding to a different set of experiences. And although he's just as concerned with art history, and we can talk about trends and movements in the development of literature. We have to be very clear, um, cautious about applying these concepts which have been developed in the West in order to describe Western literature to African literature. Uh, Dr. Palmer, Palmer um, what are some themes, forms, and styles that modern writers and future writers should make sure that are uniquely African, that they should make sure that they embrace in their writing as they move forward? Oh, well, um, yeah, thank you for that. Modern African writers, well, of course, at the start, they were very much concerned with the, the clash between imperialism and traditional African society. Then they moved to the whole issue of the resistance to European imperialism and so on. But after that, they concerned themselves, and this is what they concern themselves with now, and this is what I think they ought to concern themselves with mostly, the current state of African affairs. In other words, what we Africans have ourselves made of the African content, continent after imperialism. This is the kind of... Um, area that is called social comment, commenting on the nature of African society after independence as Africans seek to um, define the values and their position in the world um, community. African writers, well, in a sense, um, I don't want to be prescriptive. I think it will be difficult to say this is what they should be doing. Uh, and, but, but um, I would much rather describe what they are doing and saying that this is important. Um, they must also, um, they are also concerned about the position of women in Africa. And one of the most interesting developments in African literature in the last 25 years was the upsurge of a tremendous number of women writers, like Buche Mecheta, uh, um, who dealing with the, uh, the condition of the African woman. And they too, these women writers, are very much in the front rank of, uh, uh, of, uh, of African um, writers. These are um, the, the most important um, issue. Um, so dealing with the corruption, the incompetence that is um, uh, currently in Africa, but also the hope for the future. Because there are tremendous things happening in Africa, um, very good things, which some people over here are not aware of. African writers, yes, some of them are also dealing with these. People like Achebe, like um, Shoinka, um, like Ngugi, uh, and, and so on. Chester was... What do, you, what do you think about um, some African science fiction writers like Nnedi Okorafor? Well, quite honest, um, th that is not one of my areas. Science fiction okay. is not but, one of my... But, okay, <laughs> but, but what do you think about African writers writing science fiction since that's a, a Western, you know, um, Well, again, one must not be prescriptive and say that this is the African writer must do. The African writer must not touch that kind of area. If the African writer feels that science fiction is important, that um, Africa must in fact be engaged with science, then I think he has every right to write about science fiction. And mark you, what is science fiction today might well be true science tomorrow. <laughs> 
through science tomorrow. So it isn't just science fiction. Science isn't, whether it's um, a, a vision of what will happen in the future or not, is engaged with the development of humanity, with the development of the world. And the African writer also should be engaged with, with development. Uh, Africa certainly needs to be engaged with development. Therefore, I would not say that he should not touch science, um, science fiction. Of course, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, what we call in the West myth, yeah. right? Belief, uh, rituals, mm -hmm. uh, ceremonies, etc. cetera, um, uh, as science. Mm -hmm. And that becomes this, the, the, it, it, the stuff nothing, of science yeah. fiction. There's so nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Because quite a lot of African so-called myths, what a lot of would say is myth, has rarely got a scientific basis. I could give you one example. Um, there are certain African medicine men, and I prefer to use the expression medicine men rather than witch doctors. Medicine men who are the best curers of fractured bones that I know. Oh yes, and I tell you what they do. When you go to them with your fractured, your, your broken bone, um, they try to invoke the spirits and it looks like myth and something supernatural kind of thing. Then they'll say to you, okay, go and bring me a white cock. It's always white. Um, and bring me some other things. And then he recites his lines. He tries to invoke the spirits or he gives you the impression that he's invoking the spirits. And maybe he believes that he's invoking the spirits. Then he places the herbs and so on on your foot. And then he takes the cock that you have brought and breaks its leg. And you might say, oh, this is cruel and all that. But I'm told that this scientific basis, he says bone is bone. And it will take all bone the same time to heal as it takes the cock's bone to heal. So he lets the cock go, but he watches the cock. And when the cock's bone is healed, he says, yes, it's time your own bone <laughs> has healed. And then he removes the wrappings and it confirms that your bone has healed too. So it might look like superstition and all that, but it has got a scientific basis. I, I, I tell you another thing. The, the, these medicine men are the best people for curing insanity. I know this myself. You know, um, I, two young men who I come from, they were as mad as mad can be. If their parents had taken them to the local psychiatric hospital, they would just have languished there. But their parents took them up country to the medicine men. And believe me, when they came back, they were healed. I saw them, both before they went and when they came back. Now, they were rather dodgy on their legs because the part of the treatment is beating. <laughs> you see, the medicine man, he... And again, of course, there, there, there are incantations and all kinds of things. But he reasons, he says, this man, with him, he will not understand it. But you can feel your beating. This is how he argues. It, um, do the cures. So um, African myth, my other brother, my brother was also interested in this, was telling me that at times you have, you go to a medicine man um, uh, and ask him to kill someone for you. And um, he sends a snake, which you might not see, and the snake will pierce your foot and all that kind of thing. You don't see it. But my brother was trying to convince me that he, it's a question of manipulating <laughs> this, the, the, the snake, this thing, which has got poison at its end, and that is how the individual um, is hurt. So um, we have to be very, very careful about calling these things myth. Right, yeah. right. No, uh, not yet, but I'm going to see it, yeah, definitely. And <laughs> some African writers, um, and, and some of this is being made in the movies, and it's mm. Black Panther's one of them, uh, where you have um, um, African beliefs, mm -hmm. such as ancestors, mm -hmm. you know, the involvement of ancestors in a person's life, 
that can be a healing uh, agent, right? One, someone sick or someone's, you know, having problems, you know, or yeah, something yeah. like that, that one can in fact engage the ancestors oh, yeah. that, that were okay. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, what I find interesting and very dynamic is that there are African writers who are appropriating that and looking at that as a form of science yeah. Yeah. and using that as a basis for their fiction, right? Mm -hmm. And science fiction. So that African science fiction tends to be very different yeah. than yeah, and, like and, Isaac Asimov and yeah, you know right. other folks. And I, I doubt whether I would even call it science fiction. Right. <laughs> In fact. Right, right. Um, uh, but it's there, and uh, you're quite right, the writers are using it. And um, in some cases, you can see that this, in fact, um, uh, something which is too way out, in fact, is based on some kind of knowledge. It's amazing the amount of knowledge, scientific and otherwise, that there was in traditional Africa. And there still is in, uh, in traditional Africa. One of the problems in Africa, you see, is um, and this is one of the reasons why we haven't moved forward um, faster. Um, the, the European, ever since the Renaissance, the moment he made a discovery, he published it. <laughs> Everyone got to know about it. The African doesn't. The African finds out something, he knows something. He keeps it to himself and maybe just passes it on to his son, or passes it on to his son. And the thing is never really publicized. Maybe because they feel that if they make it public, someone else will go and profit from it. I'll give you one example. My father, um, before he passed away, he fell ill, he had um, prostate problems. And he said to me, you know, um, there were some old men, women in my village who used to cure this. They called it the old man's disease, and they cured it with a mixture of gene and something else. So he said, I have forgotten the something else, but I'll try to look at my papers and see whether I can find it. Gene for me, I got the gene for him. But he could never find the something else. There were these women, and it was women who did this cure, who knew about this, but it was never published with it. So I, I honestly think that this is one of the problems with Africa, this um, belief that you must keep it in a cult and only members of the cult must be aware of it. Um, this I think is something we ought <laughs> to rethink. There, um, in Africa, for instance, uh, where I come from in Sierra Leone, there are people who can take certain mixture and blow it through um, a reed and affect the victim with a terrible skin disease which then goes onto the blood and the person dies horribly. There are people who know the antidote, but unless you belong to the hunter society, I'll tell you about the antidote. So this I think is a problem in Africa. Um, the way in which we disseminate now Good question. Good question. <laughs> uh, as an African uh, literary critic, uh, what do you see as some of the major weaknesses of African writers? Like, <laughs> uh, that's a, a, a really a difficult question. It's difficult to, uh, well, everywhere you have good writers and bad writers. I think um, one of the major weaknesses is that some African writers are not in full control of the linguistic medium. I think that you have to be in full control of the linguistic medium. Either like a Achebe, you must be aware that you must bend it and so on. This I think is one of the major weaknesses that you read some of those works where you see that language is not being properly um, proposed, I think. I think this is what I would say. Thank all of you for your questions. Uh, students, I'm so proud that you were here today to listen to this information. And I hope you go away well informed and uh, maybe at some point, uh, we may be offering a course in African literature uh, for the undergraduates or for 
non-majors as opposed to just to majors. Uh, hopefully, you will show an interest. I would like to acknowledge uh, certain individuals. Dr. Monica Miller, I think, has her. J. Dr. Daryl Morrison, and my colleague across the hall from me. Doug, 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 Doug. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for being here. And Dr. Matthews is here. Uh, Daryl Hancock, uh, Chester Fontenot from Mercer University, Director of Africana Studies over on Mercer's campus. Dr. Beek. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, Dr. Beek is here. And from the Africa. Dr. Charles Uber from Georgia College here in, in support of his colleague, Dr. Palmer, Peter Makaya, Dr. Peter Makaya from Middle Georgia State, mostly Conklin and Dublin campus. Uh, and students, just, just thank you. Thank you. I'll let Dr. Makaya give the close. Oh, I, I want to recognize my African uh, studies <laughs> students. Stand up, my students. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you have three students did um, they're in dr chip rogers class and it was a class project and the name of the course is on the back but uh thank you for working with us dr mccoy thank you thank you uh dr miss just stole my thumb she said everything i wanted to say <laughs> but let, let's give dr palmer a of applause Wow, 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 wow. This is interesting. We want to thank Dr. Palmer for being the first keynote presenter for our first Africa lecture series. We are very, very proud of you. We thank you so much for taking time out of your such your busy, busy schedule to come and talk to us. He has such a superb knowledge of African literature. You know, growing up in Anglophone Africa, meaning we were under the British, uh, we were not ex exposed to a lot of work or works done by Africans. Uh, we were, I was an expert in Shakespeare. I could read everything on Shakespeare, you know, all of those. But we never had a lot of exposure to works done by Africans. And see, when I started to hear people like, you know, Dr. Palmer, he used to visit Zimbabwe, University of Zimbabwe. He is known all over Africa. I was just so impressed. Uh, to cut the long story short, we thank you so much for coming. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you.